chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let me open us in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that you've preserved it for us. We thank you that your word is pure, that it's without error, it's without corruption. It says exactly what you would have us to know. Give us understanding, Lord, as we turn to your word. Help us to know what you would have us to do. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So 2 Timothy 2 commands us to study the Bible. It's, it's, it's the most explicit command in the Bible to study it. And notice what it does. It tells us how to study it. Notice what it says there. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, if we're commanded to rightly divide the word of truth, then the Bible must have divisions in it. If it didn't have divisions, we, it would, wouldn't make any sense to rightly divide it. So the Bible has to have divisions, and we'll, we're going to look at what some of those are. What the verse also tells you is that it's very possible to wrongly divide the word of truth. It commands us to rightly divide the word of truth because there's ways to divide it that are incorrect. So we know the Bible has divisions, and we have to be careful as to how we divide it. Get with me Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Now the word meat, we often think of the word meat as meaning animal flesh. But the word meat, actually one of its meanings is the word food. In Genesis 1.29, what God clearly did is he gave Adam and Eve a vegetarian diet. Right? It only discusses there them eating plants. It doesn't say anything about eating animals. Look with me at Genesis 9 verse 3. Genesis 9, verse 3. Genesis 9, 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Get Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus 11, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. In other words, there's some ye eat, some you don't. Verse 3, Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof. As the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is un unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you, and so on. Now here's what I want you to notice. We've only gone three books into the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. There are three different instructions about how to eat. Genesis 1 was vegetarian or vegan. Genesis 9 said, every moving thing that liveth, Leviticus 11 was complicated, right? Depending upon whether it divides the hoof and chews the cud, some animals are clean, some animals are unclean. Now, do all those verses say the same thing? They don't. How do you know which one to follow? You just pick the one you like? You say, well, look, I don't want to be a vegan, man. Can't eat bacon. So Genesis 1's out. But then Leviticus 11, well, that's out too. Right? Because in Leviticus 11, the, the swine are unclean. So, okay, I figured it out. I want Genesis 9 because that's what I like. Is that legitimate? You just pick whatever you like? Here's what I want you to notice. 
Genesis 1 is right there. Genesis 9 is right there. Now that's only a couple inches apart, but that's 1,600 years apart. Big passage of time. Leviticus 11 is right there. The point is, the Bible is a book of progressive revelation. Has anyone here ever read a, a novel? Have you ever read a mystery? Have you ever watched a movie? Well, what makes a movie, what makes any story interesting, is the unfolding of information over time. You don't know at the beginning of the story everything that you know at the end, obviously, right? There's, there's development. There's progression. The Bible is the exact same way. Many, many years ago, when I was first saved, I was taught by someone that was trying to help me, and they told me that the Bible was God's love letters to man. And so the Bible was all for me, and I could read anywhere in it because it was all to me. And that sounded like such a great, exciting notion, right? Because just pick any old place you like, put your finger down, and it's for you. That's just not true. That's just not true. What if I did this? What if I did, you know, in a couple months here, we're going to have to file our taxes. What if I did this? What if I, you know, decided, look, IRS, I looked at the tax rates for 2017, and I just really don't like them. And the ones from the mid-'80s, I just like a lot more. They speak to me. And so, therefore, I'm going to use the 1984 return, or 1986, I think is a little better. Let's do 1986. And I file a return and say, look, I'm just going to use that. What would they say? Well, what they would say is, you know, Mr. Reed, we'd like to send someone to speak to you. And the point is, you have to go by the current revelation. You can't just pick things that aren't written to you. It's the equivalent of driving up and down the street, opening every mailbox and taking the mail you want. It's thievery. Here's what's going on. What God wrote in Genesis 1 to Adam was perfectly true and perfectly accurate, but he changed his course of dealings over time. He gave different information to Noah. He gave different information to Moses. And for our purposes, he gave different information to Paul. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. One of the things that people will say sometimes is they will say dispensationalism was invented in the 1800s, and it didn't exist before that. Now, that's just crazy talk. The every thinking person believes in progressive revelation because that is your normal life experience. You're going to learn things tomorrow that you didn't know today, right? The government's going to pass new laws this year that it didn't have last year. That's just how it works. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, so that's in the latter times the dispensation of grace, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and then notice, and doctrines of devils. People think that what devils do is they haunt houses. They cause electronics not to operate. I wonder if that part's actually true. I'm kidding. But you know what devils actually do according to the scriptures today? Doctrines. False doctrines is what 1 Timothy 4 says. Now notice this. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Is that what Leviticus 11 says? Leviticus 11 said there are some animals that are unclean and you can't eat them. 1 Timothy 4 says for every creature of God is good. How do you resolve that conflict? Some people would say the Bible contradicts itself. 
No, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. What the Bible does is it says different things to different people at different points in time. Do you need to build an ark today? No. Did Noah need to build an ark? Yes. After the flood, God put a rainbow in the sky declaring that he would never flood the earth again. All right, so get with me Galatians chapter 2. What that demonstrates is that there is progressive revelation in the Bible. It was so good it killed the batteries. I wish. Yeah, the satanic attack. Um, so here's the thing, guys. Uncircumcision and circumcision are not the same. I mean, you know, just a basic knowledge of the English language tells you that, right? So do Peter and Paul have the exact same gospel? They don't. They don't. They can't. I mean, if words mean anything, they have different gospels. So the notion that there's only one gospel in the Bible is just simply not correct. Get with me, if you would, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord, during his earthly says to them, don't go to the Gentiles. He couldn't be more clear. Look with me at Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. Verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan, so this is a Gentile woman, came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Notice verse 23. But he answered her, not a word. Don't even respond to her. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. After she was talking to the Lord and didn't get a response, she started reaching out to the, to the apostles and saying, Help me. Verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat, it's not appropriate, to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. What did he just say that this woman of Canaan was? He's saying she's a Gentile dog. Now listen, could the Lord, did the Lord sin when he said that? Obviously, the Lord couldn't have sinned. So what he's saying there is not wrong, it's not inaccurate, it's not cruel, it's a statement of, of truth. In other words, under the Old Testament, was there a difference between Israel and Gentiles? There was. This is the children, that's the dogs. Look with me at verse 27. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. When the Gentile woman says to him that the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table, she's saying under the Abrahamic covenant, a Gentile can be blessed through Israel, and that's the blessing that I'm looking for. When she says that, the Lord recognizes her faith. He says essentially that's exactly right, and he helps her that very moment. Look with me at Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles... Paul's addressing specifically Gentiles there. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. The word apostle 
means one who is sent. So when Paul says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, what he's saying is, I am the one who is sent to the Gentiles. Now think, think with me just a moment ago when we were in Matthew 10. The Lord says to the twelve during his earthly ministry, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Are Peter and Paul doing the same thing? They're not doing the same thing at all. Now, if you remember, when we were in Galatians 2, Paul said that he had the gospel of the uncircumcision. Well, that gospel would make a lot of sense for Gentiles who tend to be uncircumcised. Peter had the gospel of the circumcision, which made sense for Israel that was circumcised. You see the point? What, what people think is people think, Paul comes along later, but he does the exact same thing that Peter did. No, he doesn't. He had a different gospel to a different group of people. Look with me at Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3 is a profound chapter. And I'm going, to, I'm going to just tell you up front what I think it proves, and then we'll look at the verses, and you can decide in your own mind whether it proves this or not. I'll suggest to you Ephesians 3 proves that Paul had new information that was never previously known. It had never previously been revealed. Let's see if that's true. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now again, Peter could never have said that. Verse 2, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. So when someone says dispensationalism was invented in the 1800s, the word is in the King James Bible in 1611. And the word is in the King James Bible in 1611 because it was in the Greek in the first century. Right? In other words, it wasn't invented in the 1800s. It's always been there. What happened was people ignored it. It wasn't that God wasn't aware of it. It was always there, but people often just ignore God's word. So notice what verse 2 is saying. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me, who was it given to? Paul. There was some specific information that was given Paul to you word. In other words, God didn't just give it to Paul to keep for himself. He gave it to Paul for Paul to share with mankind. Now notice verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now think about this with me just for a minute. Did Paul need revelation to know what Peter taught? So if you think about Acts chapter 9, in Acts chapter 9, Paul is on the road to Damascus. He has letters from the chief priest to persecute followers of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's, in, in Acts 9, what Paul is doing is he is actively persecuting people that have believed Peter's gospel. Okay? Just think about that. I think you'll recognize that's true. In other words, Peter's preaching. He's preaching that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And as he does that and people believe that, Paul gets irate. And he decides to persecute Christians, people that believe that, not only in Jerusalem, but even under foreign cities. So he is going to Damascus because he has authority to persecute those folks from the chief priests. Now think about this with me. Ephesians 3.3 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Well, the mystery can't be what Peter was teaching because Paul didn't need revelation to know what Peter was teaching. Paul already knew what Peter was teaching and he hated it. See the point? So if Paul received something by revelation, it had to be something that wasn't previously known. Look with me. Keep Ephesians 3, but get 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. 
But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. That verse specifically defines what a mystery is. It's a mystery even, i.e., that is, the hidden wisdom. What a mystery is, is it's wisdom that God has hidden for some period of time until he chooses to reveal it. Now, notice what verse 7 says. Which God ordained before the world unto our glory. When did God know about the mystery? Over here. Let me ask you, let me say what didn't happen. Did time play out? Things got to Acts 9, and, and Jehovah God in heaven said, wow, this is a total shock. I had no idea things were going to play out this way. I'm going to try plan B because this isn't at all what I had hoped for. It, it, you know, in other words, did, did the events of time take God by surprise and he was just shocked? And so he decided, let's try something new. Now, according to 1 Corinthians 2, the mystery... God ordained before the beginning of the world. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He was waiting for the precise time when he wanted to reveal it. Now, notice what verse 8 says. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When 1 Corinthians 2 talks about the princes of this world, it's not talking about human princes. It's talking about the, the, the satanic principalities and powers that have followed Satan in his rebellion. And what it's saying is, this mystery is something that was totally hid from Satan. He didn't know anything about it. If he had known it, what would he not have done? He would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So think about that with me, if you would, just for a minute. Do you remember Luke 22, when Judas is about to betray the Lord Jesus Christ? Right as he's about to do that, what does Satan do? Luke 22, 3, Satan enters into Judas. In other words, right here, right before the cross, does Satan want the cross to happen? Clearly, right? In other words, you, you know this, if you want a job done right, do it yourself. Right. What Satan does in Luke 22 is he wants the cross to happen. He's thinking to himself, if I leave this to the humans, they're going to mess it up. So let me enter in to Judas and get this done right. And he does. And the cross occurs. What 1 Corinthians 2 tells you profoundly is this. This mystery, if Satan had known it, you know what he would not have been in favor of? The cross. He wouldn't have been in favor of it. Well, why is that? Well, think about this for a minute. Was the resurrection a secret? Or did had God already revealed that? God already revealed that, right? Jesus Christ says in John, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So is the resurrection... A secret? No. Is the kingdom that the cross purchased, is the kingdom a secret? No, there's lots of stuff in the Old Testament, uh, especially in the book of Isaiah, about what God's going to accomplish in the kingdom. But you know what is a secret? What God is going to do with the body of Christ. So let me show you something here. Let's say that you were in Acts 7, right here, okay? And someone said, draw the timeline of history based upon what Scripture tells us. This is what you would draw. Remember Acts chapter 2? Peter stands up and says, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great notable day of the Lord. In other words, what... What Peter is saying in Acts 2 is, is he's saying right now the book of Joel, the Old Testament is being fulfilled and we're about to enter the Great Tribulation. 
Now, just understand from here to here is only one year. In other words, this thing isn't entirely to scale because it's trying to communicate information. But what Peter's saying is, look, we're in the book of Joel. We're in the last days. In fact, he specifically says in Acts 2, you should read it, we're in the last days. We're about to be right here. Because the reason he says that is this entire body of time, almost now 2,000 years, was not revealed. You know why that matters? Here's why that matters. Think about this with me. In the beginning of time, before Genesis 3, when Satan was in the garden, he obviously rebelled in heaven, right? In other words, by the time he's in the garden leading a rebellion on earth, he's obviously already rebelled in heaven. So when you get to Genesis 3, at that point, there's rebellion going on in two basic places in the universe, in the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the rest of the Bible is about the warfare that goes on in heaven and in earth. Here's why that matters. As you read through the Old Testament and you follow along what happens, does God have a program to deal with the rebellion on the earth? He does. Who's ultimately going to inherit the new earth? Israel, right? The Old Testament has promise after promise about what God is going to do, and Israel will ultimately inherit the new earth. But what the Old Testament says nothing about, what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say nothing about, what Acts 1 through 8 say nothing about, is what God's going to do with the heavens. And the reason why that matters is this. When you read the scriptures, there's never a time where an angel gets a second chance what they, once they've fallen. Once they have fallen, their eternal destiny is the lake of fire. That never changes. There's no time in the Bible where angels can reproduce and create other angels. So think about this with me, if you would. Genesis 1, God creates the angelic host. There's a limited, there's a fixed number of angels that he creates. Those angels can't create new angels. And in Genesis 1, what does God do at the end of Genesis 1? He rests from creation, right? So at the end of Genesis 1, there's a fixed number of angels in the universe. There'll never be any more than that. Then, promptly after that, there's rebellion. And now a bunch of those angels in heaven are on the wrong team. So let's say you're right here in Acts 8 and you're Satan. Here's what you would know. Well, there's been rebellion in heaven, and a bunch of the leading angels, they're, they're on my team. And God has ceased from creation. He's not making any new ones. And there's never a time where the fallen angels can get redeemed. Man can get redeemed in the Bible, but there's never a time where fallen angels can get redeemed. So Satan looks at that and says, well, you know, this is fascinating because what's he going to do? Now, God has a plan for the earth. We've been fighting about that. If you think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a fight between God and Satan about the earth. Just the simplest example. When Israel goes into Egypt and they spend 400 years there, and they come out of Egypt, and they're getting ready to go into the land, what's the first thing they find in the land? Giants, right? Why are there giants in the land? Well, there's giants in the land because when Israel's in Egypt for 400 years, do you think Satan doesn't do anything? You think he just takes a nap? Well, what he does, he says, I know that God's going to try to bring Israel back into the land. He's already said that to Abraham. God's told me what he's going to do. So what I'm going to do is during that, that time, I'm going to put giants in the land and I'm going to fortify the land. And so when God tries to bring Israel into the land, I'm going to stand against it. Now, that's not going to work because God is much more powerful than Satan. But my point is, is there a warfare going on between God and Satan for control of the earth? 
Yes, there is. You can see that. But what Satan didn't know is he looks at the heavens and says, I, I get that the Lord and I are going to fight about the earth because God's told me what his plan is and I can counteract that. But God hasn't said anything about what he's going to do with the heavens. I wonder, maybe it's mine. You th I mean, you follow me? Or let me put the question to you this way. Based upon Scripture, Genesis 1 to Acts 8, what does the Bible say about how God will take back the heavens? There's, there's nothing there about that. I mean, you sort of think that he would, but there's nothing that describes it. So when Satan puts the Lord to death on the cross, and it's really the Lord laying down his life to be accurate, he thinks this is a good thing. But then what God does in the middle of the book of Acts, he saves Paul, he gives him a mystery. That mystery is the formation of the body of Christ. That body of Christ, according to Ephesians 1.3, is blessed with all spiritual blessings. Where? In heavenly places. Because at the adoption, at the catching up, we are caught up because our inheritance, our destiny, is in the heavens. That's why the following. In the middle of the book of Acts, when Satan realizes what God is doing during the dispensation of grace with the body of Christ, what he actually says in the living Bible is oops. I made that part up. But the point is, let, let, me, be, let me be serious now. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, the body of Christ is God's replacement program for the fallen angels in the heavenly places. That's what it is. All right, back to Ephesians 3. Back to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 3, How that by revelation he made known unto the mystery. The mystery is hidden wisdom. God revealed it to Paul. Well, if God revealed it to Paul, that means it wasn't known prior to that, obviously. Now, look at verse 5. And I don't know what you do with this which in other ages was not made known. Now I realize people want to say, well, Isaiah knew it, and Jeremiah knew it, and David knew it, and Peter knew it, and Jonah knew it. What does verse 5 say? Which in other ages was not made known. It doesn't say they didn't understand it. It says it wasn't even made known. It wasn't made known because it hadn't been revealed. Look at verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Do you remember when we were in Matthew 10, go not into the way of the Gentiles? Remember Matthew 15, where the Lord says to the, the woman of Canaan that she was a dog? They weren't fellow heirs. Verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Those riches of Christ are unsearchable because you can't search them out in Genesis 1 to Malachi 3 to Matthew to Mark to Luke to John. They're not there because they hadn't been revealed. So let me just give you an example here. You probably remember this. In John 5, Jesus Christ is dealing with some folks that, that are unbelievers. And what he specifically says to them is, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. In other words, here's what he's doing. He's right here, and he's dealing with some folks that claim to believe the Old Testament, and so, but, but yet they don't believe him. And so what he says to them is, okay, guys, if you really believe the Old Testament like you claim, go ahead and search it. Because you know what those scriptures are going to point to? They're going to point to me. When you read Micah and it talks about the star coming out of Bethlehem, right? When you read Zechariah and it talks about the, the, the Lord being betrayed 
for 30 pieces of silver. In other words, if you read the Old Testament and it talks about the Lion of Judah, there's verse after verse after verse after verse that point directly to Jesus Christ. So if you were alive during the Lord's earthly ministry and you believed the Old Testament and he showed up, you'd believe him. That's why in John 5, the Lord says, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. In Ephesians 3.8, Scripture says the opposite thing. It talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ because the mystery was not in the Old Testament. You can read Genesis to Malachi. You can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you can't find out anything about it because it's simply not there. It's a mystery that was hid until God revealed it. Verse 9. Now look at this, and I don't know, I, again, I don't know what you do with this other than just be a dispensationalist. Verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, now notice this, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. If the information was hid in God, then who knew it? Doesn't say it was hid in the scriptures. It says it was hid in God. Now, here's what happens today with men. Here's the best way. If you want to make something really well known, what you do is you tell a couple people and tell them not to tell anyone else that it's a secret. Right? Because what's going to happen? Right? Because what happens is things just don't remain secrets the way that men operate. But Ephesians 3, 9 says that the mystery was hid in God. And then what did it say? From the beginning of the world. So let's recap briefly. Go to Ephesians 3, verse 1. Ephesians 3, 1. I, Paul. So this is who's writing. Verse 2. Paul was given the dispensation of the grace of God. It was given to him to give to others. Verse 3. He got it by revelation. He didn't learn it from other men. It was not something previously known. Verse 3, it's a mystery, so therefore it is hidden wisdom. Verse 5, in other ages it wasn't made known. Verse 8, it's unsearchable. And verse 9, from the beginning of the world it was hidden God. Now are you going to tell me that Peter and Paul are preaching the exact same information? That's just, that's not an honest attempt to believe what the verses say. What Ephesians 3 is designed to do, friends, is simply this. It's designed to prove beyond doubt that Paul had new and different information from Peter. Do you remember when we were in Romans 11 and Paul said, Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Paul didn't say I magnify mine person. He said I magnify mine office because his office as the apostle of the Gentiles, is what's ignored today. What people do is they think Paul just is Johnny come lately and he's doing the exact same thing as Peter. No, he's not. He's doing something different. He has a different message that wasn't previously revealed. He has a different audience, and it is incumbent upon us to recognize that. If you don't recognize that, if you go by other information, you're no different than how I was earlier when I wanted to file my taxes based upon old law. It's the same thing. What God is doing today is this. He's not doing that. Let me put it another way. If I offer an animal sacrifice today, it's not an act of faith, it's an act of unbelief. Right? I mean, God's word has told me, I don't need to do that. If I build an ark today, it's not an act of faith, it's an act of unbelief. If I keep the Old Testament law today, it is an act of unbelief. If I preach Peter's gospel today, it is an act of unbelief. It is. Because it's not what he's doing today. Let me, I'll give you another example. You're right, this happens all the time today. People are obsessed with prophecy, right? And prophecy, here's the simple, here's the simple way to understand it. 
The beast, the Antichrist, is whatever Middle East politician you don't happen to like at the moment. That's the way that it works. People read the headlines, they figure out, this is the person I don't like, so that's who the beast is. Now, by the way, when you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it tells you the man of sin isn't even revealed until after the catching up. So when people today spend their time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is, it is an act of unbelief in what 2 Thessalonians 2 says. You follow me? If 2 Thessalonians 2 says the, the man of sin isn't even going to be revealed until we're gone, how much time should you spend looking for him? You can't find him because he's not there. Or more precisely, he hasn't been revealed. And if God hasn't revealed it, you're not going to know it. You see my point? See, here's what's going on. This is how it is. God's told us exactly what he wants us to do. He revealed it through the Apostle Paul. So what we do is we spend a lot of time doing stuff over here. We spend a lot of time doing stuff over here, and we're not doing what we ought to be doing. And, and that's just how we are, right? We're, 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 we have a sin nature that rebels against God's word, and we don't do that which we ought to do. Get with me Ephesians chapter 2. So I'll just make one or two more points and I'll, I'll close. What that establishes, friends, is this. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. He's our apostle today. He was given the revelation of the mystery. If we would know what God would have us to do, that's going to be contained in Paul's writings, which is Romans to Philemon. 100% of the Bible is true. We've been all throughout the Bible. We were in Genesis. We were in Leviticus. We were in Matthew. All of it's true, but it's not all written to us today. So we should read all of it and we should study all of it, but we should apply the part that God tells us to apply. Look at Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The way that you're saved today is not by joining a church, it's not by tithing. It's not by church membership. It's not by keeping the Old Testament law. It's not by living by the golden rule. You're saved by grace through faith, by belief, in a moment, in an instant, when you believe the gospel. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. The word gospel simply means good news. Look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is really simple. The gospel is not my good deeds or my keeping the law or anything like that. The gospel is Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, Christ rose again. The gospel is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. The moment we trust that as the payment for our sins, in other words, I can't get to heaven by my good works or turning over a new leaf or keep, you know, anything that involves my works or my performance, I'm saved by what he did. When I stop trusting in myself and I trust what he did for me on the cross, that instant, that moment, I'm saved. I'm not saved as a long process of obedience. I'm saved in a moment where I trust Christ as my Savior. Amen? That's how it works. And so you can be saved that way today, and it's, it's, it's that simple. Praise God that it is. So I'll just close with, with this thought then. If, if you're not saved, you need to be saved because that's the difference between heaven and hell. Once you're saved, you can't lose it because you weren't saved by your works. You're saved by what Christ did for you. So once you're saved, I would suggest to you, here's the issue in life. God is not going to quit what he's doing because you decided to do something else. I mean, in other words, so what if, what, is God in heaven supposed to say, well, look, I really, people, I really want people to do what I told them, but since no one is, all right, I'll just go with the flow and we'll do something else. Is that what's going to happen? That is absolutely not what is going to happen. What God expects us to do today is he preserved the word for us and he expects us to read it. And he expects us to study it, and he expects us to obey it. 
So when it tells us to follow Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, that's what we should do. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you that you preserved it for us. We thank you, Lord, that we live during the dispensation of grace. We thank you that Gentiles are no longer dogs, but they're fellow heirs. We thank you that you have a purpose for the body of Christ that is infinite, that is eternal, that is glorious, that, that we don't deserve, but you've given it to us by your mercy and grace. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.